I was told this morning that I have a soft voice, so uh, I attempt to sing tenor, so uh, I'll try to be a little bit more forceful in speaking. We have been studying Hebrews, and fourth week we are in class and still on the chapter one, the beginning of chapter one, and I'm going to read the first four verses again. As I mentioned, I will be using different English translations. Uh, I know that every one of you do not have the same English translation of the New Testament. And uh, today I will be reading from the New King James Version. Verses 1 through 4 of chapter 1. God, who at various times and in different ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he has also made the world, who be in the brightness of his glory, in the express image of his person, in upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than, than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Let's review last week before we get into uh, chapter 1 again. We talked about different types of prophecy, and especially that the Hebrews author will be using what is called reappropriation prophecy, that the author's original message intended for an audience in the past is reapplied to a different time and different audience. It's actually a more complete fulfillment of the passage since the fulfillment that the Hebrews author will be referring to will be Jesus Christ. We talked about seven characteristics of the Son. He is God's prophet. The Son has been appointed heir of everything. He is the one through whom God made the universe. He radiates the glory of God. The Son also sustains the universe with his powerful word. So he's not only creator, but he's sustainer of the universe. Jesus made a cleansing, which perhaps the NASB is more accurate in that a purification for sins. He took his seat when he was finished at the right hand of God. We talked about the variety of ways that God had communicated to man in the past that are recorded in the Old Testament. And the statement by F.F. F. Bruce that the story of divine revelation is a story of progression up to Christ, but there is no, no progression beyond him. So any so-called <coughs> prophets, with new revelations, it's obviously false. <clears throat> Who are these fathers that are discussed in ch verse 1, chapter 1? Most of the time when people say the word fathers, they think of the patriarchs, uh, namely Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. However, the term fathers here is probably used what we call generically, refers to all the, the Jewish ancestors of the biblical period. The term fathers could refer to the patriarchal age. This is correct, as we see in Acts chapter 3. Could be the wilderness generation. Could be the prophets. And prophets were good since God spoke to, spoke to them, but Jesus is better. What is a prophet? Prophet's a spokesman. He speaks for another. We see basically this definition of a spokesman in Exodus and, and in chapter 4 and 7 uh, with discussion of Moses. Jesus is a prophet since God has spoken to us through him in these last days. So if you're a spokesman, a prophet, and God is speaking through Jesus, he is a prophet. What are these last days. It's the last days basically literally means the Christian age and that extends from the day of Pentecost uh, 
to the end of the world. Christianity was the gold of the Old Testament, and the advent, which is the arrival of the Son, marks the beginning of the end of days. The New Testament regards the new the Christian age as the last age that there will be. We have been in, quote, last days since the day of Pentecost. In the Bible, you can trace five dispensations uh, that are characterized by covenants. You have the age of Adam and Eve. You have the Noahic age. You have the patriarchal age, the Mosaic age, and the Christian age. And in the Christian age, God brought salvation by Christ. As we mentioned, this will be the last age until the destruction of the world. However, the Hebrews author is only going to be concerned with two ages, the Mosaic age and the Christian ages. Let us discuss the superiority of the Son. Has spoken is the first verb that is used in the book of Hebrews. And it's actually the structure is having spoken. In the past, uh, he has spoken, and now he has spoken once and for all. You know, if God is divine and he has a son, the son must also be divine. If God's son speaks with divinity, that he's divinity, he can speak with greater authority than any man. Since Jesus is God, and we're going to see this in a few verses, uh, he would have the authority of the Father. So a reason that we need to pay attention. In verse 4, the author is going to shift to the main theme of chapter 1, and that is this, Christ's superiority to angels. Now, the word or phrase, having become, um, is sometimes taken to suggest that Christ was not superior uh, at a certain point. But if you drop down to verse 6, uh, you see that this suggests that Jesus is superior to the angels. So Jesus was never inferior. Literally, the term angel means messenger. And who were messengers in the Old Testament in the ancient world? These were usually slaves, okay? So you, you encountered the language of inheritance when you talk about the son, okay? So if you look in the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy 21, 17, the firstborn was privileged. He was giving a, a double portion of inheritance. Um, you know, nowadays we make out a will, we can make it any way we want. Maybe the oldest son is a scumbag and we're not going to give anything to him and we're going to leave everything to the other three sons. It's our decision, correct? But in the ancient world with the Jews, the firstborn was privileged. He got a double portion. So in saying that Jesus is God's son, a son is going to have a higher rank in even in the household of God. So Jesus has inherited this superiority. He owns everything, as we see, and he's been appointed heir of everything in verses 1-2. So not only is the name greater, it's superior, but his atoning work, we're going to find out, is also superior than the angel's. Now, if you look throughout Hebrews, um, and we could have used this for our key word, the word better. If you look at the NIV and ESV, I believe they use the word superior. Um, I actually like that word, maybe interpreted better, in, more so than better. However, the word better or superior uh, occurs 13 times in Hebrews. And the argument can be made in verse 4 that the son is superior or better than the angels because he has a more distinguished name. And uh, the author is going to use some persuasive speaking to prove his point. 
Let's look at verses 5 through 14. And the author is going to prove this point. And I, again, we'll be reading from the New King James Version. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has appointed you, has anointed you, and the oil of gladness more than your companions. And... You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? So this idea of inheritance is important. The son has inherited everything from the father. And as we see in verse 14, we're going to come to that we also, due to the son's work, inherit salvation. You know, to our minds, it would be really unnecessary to prove that Jesus is greater than angels. Most people, I would suspect, sitting in this building, grew up in the church. And it has never been taught to any individuals that Jesus was not superior to angels. However... Why would the Hebrews author go through the trouble of proving this point to the audience? Obviously, in antiquity, angels were a big deal, and there was a lot of speculation that was being spoken or written about them. You go to bookstores, and you still see that. Do you not? Do you still not see a lot of speculation in books on angels and demons that are being written, movies? It's no different. So to me, if the author is discussing that it's important for the audience to know that Jesus is more important, superior to angels, it should be more important for us to learn today as for us also. You know, in Colossians 2.18, there was a problem of angel worship. All right, so, you know, maybe there's a problem here at this congregation of angel worship. As we discuss, there is the temptation that some of these Hebrew Jew Christians were being tempted to revert back to Judaism. So maybe they're being taught that Christ is an angel, not the true Messiah. I don't know exactly, but more than likely the reason is this. Later on in Hebrews, we are going to cover that the angels had been the mediator through God, which gave the law to Moses. And we're going to see that also in other parts of the New Testament besides Hebrews. Acts 7.53 and Galatians 3.19 also support that the old law, old covenant, was given to Moses through angels. I think the author early on wants to establish the superiority of Jesus to the Old Testament. So why am I going to prove that Jesus is, quote, better or superior to angels? Because angels gave the law to Moses. And if Jesus is greater than the angels, he's greater than the old law. All right? So that's going to be the real reason. Now that the author has declared the divinity of Jesus, he goes about proving it from Scripture. 
He's going to quote seven Old Testament passages in verses 5 through 13 for five proofs why Jesus is greater than angels. And he's, these quotations come from Second uh, Psalm and Second Samuel and First Chronicles. And they're simply introduced by God says or he says. The author views scriptures as the word of God. When you use the word son, son of God, you're basically not talking about biological offspring here. When you say son of God, you mean nature or characteristics of God, okay? Not actual offspring. So understand that. So Jesus is the father's son, as we see in verse 1-5. He has the characteristics and nature of God. If you were to originally read Psalms 2-7, it refers to a human king of Israel, but the Hebrews author is going to reappropriate this to refer to Jesus. It's going to be, again, the author taking Old Testament scripture, reapplying it to Jesus to have a more complete fulfillment. 2 Samuel 7.14 was originally spoken about Solomon. However, the Hebrews author is going to reappropriate this verse to refer to Jesus, who is the greater son of David. It's a messianic promise to Jesus, not to angels. There will be three different names that are used for Jesus in chapter 1. Verse 2, he's called the Son, which I just discussed. Verse 8, he's called God. God the Father is going to call him God. And in verse 10, the word Kyrios is interpreted Lord. So no individual angel is ever called Son. In fact, there are very few angels that we know the names of. Um, Gabriel being one, you know, and uh, Michael. And uh, not many. Angels are commanded to worship the Son. We see this in verse 6. And this is a quotation from Deuteronomy 32:43 and Psalms 97:7. The term "firstborn" here means uh, preeminence. Okay, it does not mean born first. All right. Um, Jesus is not a created being, as Jehovah Witnesses claim. He is firstborn because he gains this inheritance from God. David is called firstborn. However, David, he was not a firstborn child, correct? He was one of the younger children. The term, when you say firstborn, is a term of superior rank, all right? That is what it means. Even after the son is introduced into the created world, Angels are required to worship him. So therefore, you know, verse 4 in chapter 2, 9, don't refer to status, for only deity is to receive worship. So nowhere in the Bible does a superior worship an inferior. You'll find that absolutely nowhere. An inferior will proskuneo, which will literally bow down to a superior. So our first premise from this passage is this. If A, God is the only one worthy of worship, and B, angels are not to be worshipped, and C, Jesus is, Jesus is worshipped by human beings with no rebuke, and D, Jesus is is worshiped by angels, as we see in verse 6, then Jesus cannot be an angel. He is deity, for only deity is to be worshiped. So he is worshiped by angels and humans. It was not forbidden. Our second premise is that A, God is the only one of worship, only one worthy of worship, 
and we'll see this in Revelation 22, 9, where John fell down to the angel to worship him, and the angel said, no, don't do that. Matthew 4, 10, and B, angels are not to be worshipped. Colossians 2, 18, and Revelation 22, 8, and 9. And Jesus is worshipped by human beings with no rebuke. Matthew 28, 17. And D, Jesus is worshipped by angels, as we see here in Hebrews 1, 6. So the conclusion <coughs> is that Jesus is no angel. He cannot be an angel. He is deity, so he is worshipped by angels and humans. It was not forbidden. As we mentioned in verse 10, the Son, or excuse me, verse 8, the Son is addressed as God. All right? Let's read verse 8 here again. You're your throne, O oh God, is forever and ever. So, Jesus is addressed as God, supporting the writer's argument that he is superior. If you look at how this sort of goes in that Jesus is addressed as God, verses 7 through 9 state that angels are created ministers. Again, what's a minister? It's a servant, right? Um, the Son is a ruler forever. Jesus is eternal. They are not. The Son made the earth and heavens. The angels made absolutely nothing. Verses 10 through 12. He is deity. They are not. The Son is vindicated by the Father. And the angels are not in verse 13. The Son will sit at God's right hand. They will not. Any questions? As we've seen here in chapter 1, there are already several quotations from the Old Testament. In fact, in Hebrews, there's 35 of them. And every, every book in Hebrews will have quotations from the Old Testament or allusions to the Old Testament. Fourteen of these quotations are from the book of Psalms some of them what we would call the royal psalms. The author of Hebrews almost always quotes the Septuagint, and which is the Hebrew Old Testament translated into Greek. Although his quotations don't exactly match the LLX, LX, LXX 70 uh, in every case or detail. Inspired writers certainly could take liberties that we cannot do with the inspired text. They could change verb tenses. They could accommodate the language to make a particular point or argument. Just a word or two about the Septuagint, which is the author's favorite choice of quoting the Old Testament, the, which is the Greek Old Testament. The word Septuagint means 70, as I mentioned, which I totally messed up. LXX, that's how it's going to be abbreviated, the Roman abbreviations. And the reason that it acquires uh, that name is from the letter of Aristeos, which was written in the second century BC that described the fanciful tale of the origin of the Septuagint. And it's got a lot of fanciful tales in this letter of Aristeos, and that the, you know, one being that the, the letter, uh, it was translated from a Torah that was written with letters of gold, okay? I mean, who writes in gold? Not too many people, right? <laughs> and, uh, so, and that's why everybody thinks that, that uh, the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek in the 250 BC is because of this letter. At the time of the New Testament, there is no such thing as a definitive Greek New Testament. That's why you're going to see so much variety in, in quotations of Philo, Josephus, in his writings, in the New Testament. Um, just like nowadays, I talked about I'm going to be using different English translations. Um, we have different English translations. There were different Old Testament Greek translations that were being used also. So they're not all going to match. 
Later Jewish translation states that there were actually, instead of 70, 72 Jewish scholars, there were six from each tribe, being 12 tribes, and they each independently translated the Hebrew text into Greek, and when they matched them up, they all were perfect. They were miraculously interpreted. And obviously, if I had 72 people here that copied the entire Old Testament, they're not going to match perfectly here, okay? No matter how smart you are. So just understand that there's different uh, Old Testament versions. The Septuagint is frequently used by New Testament authors, and that's because it was widely circulated at that time. Angels are created ministers, but the Son is a ruler forever, as we saw in verses 7 through 9. Angels are ministers, not in the sense that they're religious figures. We call Tony a minister, as we mentioned, or it means servant. But they are helpers to those who are superior, all right? Since they're helpers to us, as we see in verse 13, the heirs of salvation, we are superior to angels. These quotations in verses 7 through 9 come from Psalms 104, and Psalms 45. Verse 7 shows that angels have no power of their own, and they purely exist at the pleasure and will of God. God does whatever he wants with them. He can create angels as he pleases, and they can literally be spirits, winds, flames of fire. They're created to obey God. The idea is that God makes them whatever he wants to make them. We talk about seasons. We're coming into, we're now in spring, right? Are not spring, summer, fall, and winter transient? Um, this verse, when they're spirits, flames of fire, they're just transient beings, okay? And their deeds are as transient as, as to changes in nature. But this is not the case with Jesus. Verses 8 through 9 show that Jesus is not created or changed in form. He rules with a scepter of righteousness. And if you look at the background of the word scepter, it means absolute authority. Think of Esther 5. When Esther comes into the presence of the king, she actually touches the gold scepter, all right? She's acknowledging the power of the king, all right? So the son has a scepter of righteousness, an absolute authority. We saw that he is called God by God the Father himself, all right? Also, this oil of gladness basically refers to a feast where the guests were anointed with perfumed oil. It's referring to an exaltation, okay? Um, when you would go to a wedding feast in antiquity, you were many times given wedding garments, and you were smeared with some oil to make you smell good, okay? You were anointed with oil. It was customary. It's just an exaltation. And the context would suggest that these companions, were the all of gladness more than your companions, are the angels. In verses 10 through 12, we see that the sun made heaven and earth, but the angels did nothing. And this quotation is from Psalms 102. And the proof of this is that the sun is called Lord. This would be the word Kyrios. He created the world and will destroy it as we see in Colossians chapter 1 as well. And we read in verse 3 that the Son is creator and also sustainer. So who created the angels? If 
Jesus is the creator who created angels. Jesus. He is the creator of angels. And you have this comparison to an old garment. What happens to clothing? I know that Larry and I, we take old clothing and we put it in our smokers to burn, you know, when we're sort of done with it. Um, Burns pretty good. Um, you get rid of it, right? It rots if you, if you don't keep it enclosed in something. Um, you know, there's been a lot of scientific theories out there, and the second law of thermodynamics states that things have a natural tendency to degenerate and get disorganized. And this verse 11 is a clear, clear expression of the second law of thermodynamics with degeneration. But Jesus is not like this old garment. He is forever. He is unchanged. And he will never change. If you look at the beliefs of Jehovah Witnesses, and the reason I've been harping on this a little bit, is that they actually believe that Jesus Christ is Michael the Archangel. That is their belief. They believe that Jesus is a created being and that he is actually Michael the Archangel. If you look at Mormon beliefs, <clears throat> Jesus is also a created being and that Satan or Lucifer is actually literally Jesus' brother, his younger brother. All right? Um, obviously, neither belief has any scriptural basis. But, you know, be careful of, of people, you know, Mormonism telling you of their belief in Jesus. And, and they don't tell you the exact background of a lot of their beliefs. If God calls Jesus Lord, which is an expression of deity in verse 10, if you're a Jehovah Witness, how do you reconcile this passage? if Jesus is deity. You can't. You can't uh, reconcile this interpretation and be consistent with biblical teachings. So our first premise is that, A, if the Hebrews writer is inspired, and we believe that all scripture is inspired, then B, the writer claims that the Son, Jesus, is called Lord, which is Yahweh, then Jesus is Lord, or Yahweh. Our second premise, A, is that the Hebrews writer is inspired, 2 Timothy 3.16, that all scripture is, is inspired. And B, the writer claims that the Son, Jesus, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1.5, 1, 1, 1, 1.8, is called Lord, and 1.10. Therefore, Jesus is God, he's Yahweh. Verse 13. But which, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? This is a quotation from Psalms 110, verse 1. This is really a, an extremely important passage in Hebrews. It's going to defend Jesus' eternal priesthood and his ability to rule. When you say the word footstool, it brings to mind the ancient Near Eastern custom of the conqueror placing his feet on the neck of the conqueror. We see this in Joshua chapter 10. Um, it's a sign of authority. You you capture king or individuals, you put your foot on their neck, it's a sign of domination, right? And it's a total sign of domination and authority. So the son is recalled to sit. And this is in the present tense, so it's ongoing. And he's awaiting final vindication at the hands of the father. So, sit at my right hand till, until I make your enemies your footstool. 
So the idea to understand from this verse here is that Jesus has done his work. He's come to earth. He sacrificed himself for us. He's returned to heaven. And he's asked to sit and understand this is not little. All right. He's asked to sit at the right hand of God until God finishes what he began. However, the work of Christ is finished in that aspect. No angel sits in the presence of God and certainly not at the right hand of God. What is the purpose of angels? You know, in looking at verse 14, it states that they are ministering spirits. It answers how they work. They are sent out. They can't do whatever they want. Okay, they are sent by God, and they are servants. So they are, they are sent for service, and God obviously is behind this. And it answers, verse 14 answers, for whom they do work, because of those about to inherit salvation. Are angels inheriting salvation? No. Mankind is the one that is inheriting salvation. And this statement is going to lead into chapter 2. Angels work for us. We are the ones who are inheriting salvation. Not in the directly in the sense that there are each of us have a guardian angel which has been expounded through the ages. However, angels work on behalf of God's people, the saved. I don't know how they work, and the author doesn't go into how they do work. However, this idea of each of us having our guardian angels is not scripturally supported in the New Testament. And it's not the author's intention to discredit angels. In fact, angels were, to the author, extremely important. They gave Moses the Old Testament, the Old, well, the Old Covenant. So he's directing attention to the superiority of the Son. So how can we summarize chapter 1? Well, I'm getting to a chapter finally. <laughs> This argument actually is going to finish up in chapter 2-4. You know, as I mentioned, chapters and verses are editorial devices of men. Chapter 1, one of the points is to prove that Jesus is deity. And that's why I have beat that subject up quite a bit. And that he is superior, better, if you want to use that term, than the angels and prophets. Jesus is deity. He's not a created being. And obviously, this is a teaching of Jehovah Witnesses and Mormonism, for that fact. Previously, prophets and angels provided guidance from God as messengers. But in the final days, the Son is God's prophet, and he will provide guidance. The Holy Spirit who is directing the author to write, is telling us to pay attention to what Jesus says. He is the final revelation from God speaking as his prophets. There are going to be no later prophets than Jesus. You don't have Muhammad, you don't have Joseph Smith, and etc. The final revelation is the written word of God, the New Testament. We live in a universe of divine creation. It states that Jesus is the creator and sustainer. We're not products of evolution. We are created. We need to ask ourselves, where should our priorities be? We see at the end of chapter 1 that angels providentially help us. How? We're not told. And it's just speculation if if we give an opinion on how this works. Jesus made a purifications for sins. New King James will say purged. And 
sat down at the right hand of God. Man is spiritually lost and needs guidance from Jesus on how to come from a lost condition to a saved condition, and this can only be provided by God. I have two minutes. Well, next week we will start on chapter 2 of Hebrews. And in this chapter, there certainly will be exhortations against apostasy. We have certain religious denominations that believe that it is impossible to apostatize. We will certainly make scriptural arguments against that, that belief. We will see that Christ was made lower than the angels. We read in verse 6 that this was not in relation to who he was, but just physically. I mean, Christ became man so he could die, correct? And the Hebrews author is also going to be talking about this idea, as Isaiah does, as a suffering servant. The theme of suffering is also a major theme of Hebrews. So if you would, for next week, read chapter 2. And we will start there. Thank you for your attention.